have the translation into uh, French, uh, it would it seems that it would still make sense to say that what Hesperus and Phosphorus, then in French, uh, designates the same word, designate the same thing in English. I mean, uh, because you're seeing here, it works as a, a crushing argument against any sort of semantic assent strategy. But why, in the case of identity, in the case of identity, I don't see exactly why it's crushing. How it works. Yeah. How the French, yeah. how, the, how the translation works. Uh, so uh, let's see. Let, let's try this. Um, this may help. Okay. Instead of Hesperus as phosphorus, try the sentence: the first heavenly body visible at dusk is the last heavenly body visible. So we've got uh, phosphorus. First heavenly body visible at dusk, that's Hesperus. And the last heavenly body visible at dawn, that's phosphorus. And the semantic ascent theory says what that means isn't that there's a heavenly body that's the last one, and there's a heavenly body that's the first one, and they're the same. But instead, it means that the phrase, which is an English phrase, the first heavenly body visible at dusk, and the phrase, the last heavenly body is a blood gone, co-designate in English. Right? And uh, uh, Church says, take the first sentence and translate it into French, and you're going to get something that doesn't involve any mention of any English expressions. Take the second, the analysis, and translate it into, in, into French, and you're going to be quoting English phrases. You're going to be saying this English phrase and this English phrase, co-designate. Well, that's just di different piece of information. Somebody might know what's expressed by the first and not what's expressed by the second. Somebody who speaks French but no English would, get, would gain different information from these two different sentences. They clearly don't mean the same thing. That is, their French translations clearly don't mean the same thing in French. But those translations do preserve the meanings of the English. So the English sentences that we begin with also don't mean the same thing. It's a little bit harder to see with Hesperus and Phosphorus, but it, I think the same thing is true even there. Because when you say Hesperus is Phosphorus, you're saying, this is something that Frege will agree with, the Frege of 1892, right? You're saying something about the planet Venus. Whereas when you say, quote Hesperus and quote Phosphorus, co-designate in English, you're, you're making a claim about these names, and you're making a claim about the English language. Uh, which has nothing to do with the planet. I mean, those names, I shouldn't say it has nothing to do with the planet, but the fact that these two names co-designate is due to our own activities, human culture, human history, human language usage. Whereas the fact that Hesperus is Phosphorus, according to Frager, is true independently of anything that humans have to do with. So the translations, actually Church even says when he gives a translation argument, the use of translation here is not essential. You can make the same point without translation. You can see it without translation. Instead, this translation simply facilitates. It makes it more obvious that these two sentences don't mean the same thing. Teresa, do you want to say something? I just, I, I, I wanted to ask a question that's related to this, and mm -hmm. wait till you're done. Well, let's see if Marco, you, yeah. go ahead. Um, yeah, so when you just gave, um, when you just gave that argument, right, you didn't appeal to the fact that um, the truth value of 1f and 1f prime, um, I mean, the, the, you know, on, uh, on another possible world, those can come apart, right? The truth values can come apart. And, and you basically just said, look, the first one is, um, well, I could let's not, maybe not use the president of France, but the pres president of France or whatever, right? The first one's about the pres president of whatever, um, of, of France and the um, isn't there also a president? Anyway. Oh, um, yeah, so I, I just won't want to refer around right here for okay. sort of the analogous position. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, and, um, you know, that, that's about the president of France, whereas 1F prime, I mean, the analog to that um, is about, you know, a term in, in mm -hmm. English. And then, you know, about the Ungarada theory of exist, right, which you said the church subscribes to, it seems like you can say, the same thing, I mean, even though the, the, um, 
you know, they're not going to come apart moldily, but, you know, I think, well, there's just this intuition that, um, you know, 1F is a, about, or this analog is about yeah. the present, president of France and not about this concept in the everyday sense of concept, right, but not about this sense. Um, and so it's curious to me that church, um, you know, that, that you think this is church's theory, I'm just, you know, to say something about that? Is that yeah, I'm not sure. The the, yeah, the I'm not sure something. that this really is Church's theory, but I remember reading a passage in his uh, beautifully elegant introduction to mathematical introduction to mathematical logic, mm -hmm. volume one, mm -hmm. Everett Volume Two. Mm -hmm. This beautiful logic. Must be has, volume zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's this logic textbook by Church. You can't use it as a logic textbook can't possibly use it. But there's an introduction to that textbook, which is really elegant. It's probably the most beautiful statement of a Freudian uh, point of view that ever has been written. And there are long footnotes, each of which could be a separate paper. And one of, one of the footnotes gives this example of something like, I think the example might be, it's, it's either the present king of France does not exist, or the fountain of youth does not exist, or something like that. And several other examples gives three or four. And this is the only one that involves existence. The others involve propositional attitudes or something like that. And he says in each of these, we've got an ungarada operator, we've got an oblique operator, um, which induces something to shift to referring to a sense. And one of them is the fountain of youth does not exist. So I remember reading that and being struck by it. What, what does he think is the ungarada operator here? And I thought it's either not, just a straight old negation, or exist, right? And actually, I think his view is one or the other of those two. I suspect it's that exists as an right operator that he thinks the reason this is true, even though the phrase the founding of youth designates nothing, is that exists is an ungarada operator. The negation is just working by negation. It's possible that he thinks that not as an ungarada operator. You know, the textbook has the ordinary truth yeah, yeah. tables yeah. for negation. So you think that he must think that exists is an right operator, and it's not. It's not. An, it's not far fetched, yeah. right? It's not, especially for a Freudian philosophy of language to think if there are true negative existentials, the only way that can happen is there is designation because there's truth out there, but the designation is non-standard, not not customary. So there's some, and and I think he would. He's not a semantic ascent theorist at all, as a translation argument, right? Yeah. So if you were to raise this objection to him... I mean, you know, in a way, it's quite questions that you may right to say, well, if I, you know, I got this into it, and mm -hmm. question against this church um, position. Maybe. I mean, you're, you're saying the phrase, the present president of France exists, doesn't seem to be about a concept. Right. And I suppose Church would say, well, but it is. It is about it. Yeah, but I mean, so, so mostly I suppose there's a question about, I'm, I'm surprised that you didn't sort of push on the fact that 1F and 1F prime come apart all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they want the, the, the ones real ones. Yeah. The real ones do come <laughs> right, apart. Right. Yeah, they do come apart. Right, totally. and then, I mean, that seems, right, then you're not just saying, well, this one's about mm -hmm. this, right. and this one's about this one's about this Right. Whereas the, the analogs for the yeah, they don't theory come apart. don't come apart, so Church has that right. in, in his favor. It's actually a very nice theory. I mean, I don't agree with it, but I think it's, um, it's very difficult to refute. Yeah. I actually thought that your question <coughs> was going to be something a little bit different um, that has to do with this natural way of, of parsing um, Zero double prime. Um, you were saying something like the concept expressed by mm -hmm. alpha, mm -hmm. uh, so and so, mm -hmm. which of course is mentioning expression again. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. it's, to, it's not so supposed to be compositional it, like that, right? Yeah. Right. So. On, on, well, well, this is the thing. So on the face of it, it's it should be liable to the translation argument. Yeah. So okay. except, except actually the way we want the underground operator to work. Yeah. Um, 
in, in the, the, the expression is not being mentioned. But the thing is, it does mean that it seems to me that it doesn't even matter um, as long as um, we can rely on the fact that uh, co-designating expressions in the different languages when we're in translation um, actually have the same content. You'll still get the same truth conditions. Right? You'll still get the same truth conditions. You could then make the objection, but we're talking about, um, we're, we don't want to be talking about concepts. We can try to make the uh, objection with regard to what the subject matter. Okay. And then as you pointed out that, you know, well, it's not clear that there's a really good to Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me just make this point that you made already. Um, let's say I'll say the sense. paper 
uh, Carnap's analysis of statements of assertion of belief. It's one of my favorite papers in the history of philosophy. And the title of the paper, this is Church, is on Carnap's analysis of statements of assertion of belief, which is a rather long title, considering that the paper is about two pages long. <laughs> so most of the paper is taken up by the title. Well, most of the but he clearly thinks that these two <coughs> cannot mean the same. Uh, so that's the same thing that I think here, I think John can acknowledge that. Do you have a practice question? Yeah. Actually, I have three. Uh, <laughs> one more historical and two more systematic. The historical one refers to Frege. As far as I remember, he has as an example the sentence, Leo Sachse does not exist. That's right, yes. That's and he right. says this sentence doesn't have sense because it involves a category mistake. Oh, Existence is a second order predicate for Frege, so you can't apply a second order predicate to a proper name of an object, right? But as far as I remember, he, he criticizes in uh, the context of the uh, ontological proof of God, that God exists doesn't make sense. Yeah. He does mention this um, church approach, the semantic approach, uh, it might, what does have sense is the question, there is a person uh, designated by the name Leo Sachse, but I think these two sentences are not treated by Frege as synonymous sentences. Let me read the quote I have. Yeah. This is a dialogue with Punjer? With Punjer. Punjer on existence. Here's what Frege says. If the sentence Zaxa exists, Zaxa? Zaxa. If the sentence Zaxa exists, it's supposed to mean that the word Zaxa is not an empty sound, but designates something. Um, then it's true that the condition Zaxa exists, in quotes in here, must be satisfied in order for there are men to be inferred from Zaxa is a man. But this is not a new premise, but the presupposition of all our words. A presupposition that goes without saying. <laughs> goes without saying. Okay, so um, we can't really tell from this what his view is. He just says if the sentence Saxe exists, it's supposed to mean that the word Saxe is not an empty sound but designates then it's true that the conditions Sox exist must be satisfied in order for there are men to be inferred from Sox as a man, but this is not a new premise. So he thinks we have uh, Sox as a man, conclusion, there are men, and he says, well, we don't need a new premise that Sox exists. That's a presupposition that the, that the name Sox designates something. But that's a presupposition of all of our words, we can use any words on that they designate something. Um, I don't have in this quote anything that suggests it's either true or false or anything mm -hmm. this way. But there is another picture. I, I have another, so here's another quote from Frege. This may or may not be the one you have in mind. This is from uh, a critical elucidation of some points in E. Schroeder's Algebra de Logique, an obscure writing by Frege. Um, but it's in the Geach uh, translations from the philosophical writings. And he says, we must here keep well apart two wholly different cases that are easily confused because we speak of existence in both cases. In one case, the question is whether a proper name designates something, names something. In the other, whether a concept takes, and by concept he means a function from objects to truth values. Um, uh, let's see whether a concept takes objects under itself. If we use the words, there is a blank, we have the latter case. So in other words, when you have existential, there is a student, there is a philosopher. We have the case of whether a concept takes objects under itself. Um, now, a proper name that designates nothing has no logical justification, since in logic we are concerned with the truth in the strictest sense of the word. It may, on the other hand, still be used in fiction and fable. All right. Again, it's not clear what his view is, um, but he seems to think we use exist in two different senses. 
Sometimes we need it in the sense of there is a. And then we're talking about a concept. We're saying that this concept fall that takes objects under itself, that some objects fall into it. But we also use it in the case of Hamlet does not exist. Um, what does he say about that case? Uh, a name that has no designation really has no logical justification, but it can occur in fiction and so on. So it's hard to see from this what his view is. Oh, sorry, I've got one more quote. <clears throat> he says, people certainly say that Odysseus is not, a, not an historical person, but they mean by this contradictory expression that the, that the name, he thinks it's contradictory. That, that he says, the sentence, uh, Odysseus is not a historical person. He says, we say it, but we mean by this contradictory expression that the name Odysseus designates nothing, has no designata. He doesn't quite say that the sentence means that. He says, people who use the sentence mean by it that the name designates nothing. May I just make an, a small observation on your question? Uh, uh, um, in that second use of existence, like it doesn't, it doesn't designate anything, uh, uh, it seems that uh, this is a kind of case that for Frigg would, wouldn't be translatable into semantic content, would be more like a kind of attitude. That what, I, what I said in my talk in Curitiba was a sort of speech act. I mean, we expect that, mm -hmm. or we are taking that to be so, but uh, I, I don't think he would allow you to translate or to give a semantic uh, glossing, gloss of that. Could be. Yeah. It could be that he doesn't think the sentence really means. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, that, yeah. we are expressing our attitude or expectation or something. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's unclear to what extent what I'm calling the semantic ascent theory of existence can be attributed to Frege. It's suggested by Marx, but nothing, nothing commits him <coughs> to it. Well, maybe it. The first systematic question refers to the general project, what, to answer the question, what is existence. In my view of this question is ambiguous. <coughs> because one question is what do we actually understand in natural language of the predicate existence? And the other question is what should we understand by existence in science? I think that Brian Frey and other authors are interested in science. They want to fill truth value gaps. They are not so much interested in the semantics of the existence predicate in natural language. I think that even from a perspective from Quine, I quite could, could um, <coughs> accept your analysis of the predicate exists in natural language, but I think that's not his point. His point is to construct a different, a different but similar predicate for ontology, which works in the science. So I think it is important to make a distinction between analysis and explication, yeah. which kind of inquire made what you're doing as an analysis, but not an explication. Yeah. And what Russell is doing, I think, is explication. It's not so much analysis. I take your point that Quine, Quine's objective is somewhat different from certain mine. And Quine often, in his writings, it has a more of a prescriptive kind of uh, force rather than descriptive. He's more concerned with what language ought to be in order to be scientific. Frege felt this way. I mean, Frege was very explicit about that distinction. He'd say, in natural language, names are ambiguous. They have an indirect sense and hierarchy of senses. But in, in a perfect language, we wouldn't have any kind of ambiguity of that sort. And by perfect, Fred would be one that's suitable for, for a scientific enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, when he uses the word fiction, when he says, uh, in fiction we do this, there's a kind of a, an element of evaluative element of, that's not science. And all I really care about is science. Um, but I think science is concerned with non-existence in the ordinary sense. So when we talk about a species going extinct or you know whether there is or does, or there does, whether there exists or does not exist, a star that's a companion to the sun. You know, science is very much concerned with existence in that sense, right? And so I think Quine would be wrong to suppose that you know 
the natural language notion of existence is not something that science is concerned with. I think science is concerned with. Let's see, another point you made was that exists in response to the ontological argument. Craig uh, and Russell also make this point that it's, when you say there exists, that's not a first level concept or predicate, but second level. And uh, that's often said in response to the ontological argument. I think they mean to be some, saying something in the spirit of Kant, but with a kind of 20th century spin quantification of logic. Right? Um, and what I'm claiming is, yes, exist can be used in, this, in that sense. There exists an X FX. But there's also a sense, which is first level monadic predicate for individuals. So uh, ambiguity I'm prepared to admit, but there is one sense, which is first order predicate. Now, that's something these people tend to reject. So, I mean, Russell explicitly says, it doesn't make any sense. Ungrammatical, blah, blah, blah. And that's what I'm rejecting. Did you have another comment? Uh, we have another question for Well, uh, actually, I have three questions. I, I don't want to take too much of the time uh, we have for discussion. But, uh, let's see. Uh, so the first one is this. Does, there's something I think I didn't uh, quite understand. Um, here at uh, page four uh, and, and five, beginning on page four, you say, um, if our quantifiers are both actualist and presentist, the English verb exist is fully definable by means of a formal expression that unquestionably belongs to the category of extension of first order monadic predicate. Um, and, um, well, I'm happy to, to accept this definition, uh, but then it follows that um, everything exists, right? In this sense. And I was yeah, under the impression is, is that universal right. presence of that truth. Yes. Yeah. And I, I was under the impression you wanted to say that some things don't exist. So I'm not using a presence of that truth. I did say something like that earlier in the talk, so let's see. Yeah, on page, top of page three. Yeah. Um, line three, page three, line three. The existential quantifier in question is not restricted to individuals and exist. So when I right. say there are things that don't exist, the, the quantifier that I'm using there is not the actual present quantifier that I'm, that I'm using on the next page. I see. Yeah. To right. right, right. So you have you have two two quantifiers. One that is um, existential, <coughs> and this is the one you're using to, to define the predicate. And the other one is yeah. more wide. So I think that this definition, uh, which is DF on the handout, is in a way a cheat because the quantifier has to be understood as already yeah. invoking existence in some way. Right. If you don't think of it that way, then this definition doesn't do any right. doesn't, get any, doesn't, yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. Doesn't get the right result. Yeah, it must be some why in the sense of some existing why. Right. Then you might say you are presupposing the that's notion right. of existence. Yeah, right. But that doesn't mean it's wrong as a definition. It may not may not be an analysis of right. but uh, that's right. not it's nothing formally wrong. That's right. By the way, if if, if the quantifier in DF is not actualist and presentist. It's allowed to be unrestricted entirely. Um, this still means something, but it doesn't mean existence. Right. 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 It means and something like being. Or being, my call being. Yeah. And this is what I think, if any people here read Tim Williamson, right. I think that's what he means by existence. Right. If he ever, he actually avoids using the word existence. Right. But uh, I think he has this notion in mind as being the only logically relevant and that existence he thinks of is not a relevance to logic. Actually, I think he doesn't really even believe there is the concept that I would call existence. OK. Um, and then the, the second question is related to that, because um, it, these things Russell says, that the, it's 
Socrates exists, doesn't make any sense, this sort of thing is really puzzling and uh, absurd, really. And uh, then one wonders if we could give some other interpretation that makes sense of, you know. Uh, and I think perhaps we can. So I think Russell was speaking very loosely in the philosophy of logical atomism. So, uh, for instance, he's clearly taking. Uh, these proper names to be genuine singular terms, which he didn't really believe it were. Uh, for him, Socrates exists, it has the form DF exists, which of course he gives, he thinks is meaningful. So I think he was speaking very loosely then. Perhaps what he meant was um, um, that existence is not really a, a simple property of particulars. It's not really a simple property of sense data. It's really, of course, he would say there is such a propositional function as this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, you can say there's a y such that alpha equals y, where alpha is a genuine singular term. He, would, he can't possibly deny that. <laughs> so I mean, so I think one possible interpretation is this. Uh, what he, he's talking, in, in a, it's metaphysics he's talking about, not so much logic. He, he's saying, you know, the, the properties that exist are just the simple properties of particulars, and the particulars are all sense data. That, that's what he needs to deny when he denies that, you know, existence is not a property. And when he says it's meaningless to say Socrates exists, uh, he means that this sentence cannot be analyzed as attributing a simple property to a particular. But maybe, I mean, maybe. Because Do you think that Russell, I guess at the time of the lectures in Moscow, believed that all particulars were sense data? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Is that what it's Well, he says so explicitly. Does he? Yeah, I think so. Does he say this in the, you know, the problems of philosophy, you know, that little book? Well, no. Uh, it's I don't about know. the same time as the yeah, earlier, not so sure about the problems of thought. But in, uh, in the philosophy of logical atomism, he's explicit that, for instance, there's no such entity as Socrates. Because Socrates would have to be some, a set of uh, experiences, something like that. And then sets of log uh, uh, fictional, uh, logical fictions. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, there's not the same thing. There's not the same thing, but. Um, yeah, I think he says it quite explicitly that uh, particulars are sense data. And then also that the, the properties and relations, they're really all simple. There are no complex properties. Complex, really. They're all simple. And uh, the, the complex entities that there are are, are the, the states of effect, the facts. I don't doubt that he held that the particulars with which we're acquainted our sense data. I think he thought we were equated with propositional functions, but those aren't particulars. So the particulars that we're equated with. Well, yeah, well, this is a poor man. I don't think he believed in propositional functions as entities. Right, right maybe not. But, but yeah, maybe there are some logical particular yeah. negations. But I thought that his view was that there are also particulars that we're not acquainted with. And we even know of them. We don't, we're not acquainted with them. And we can only get at them by description. That sounds like the, the problems of philosophy. Yeah. I think he, he says that in the problems of philosophy, but not, not in the philosophical logic. There's, there's also a paper of his called Knowledge by Acquaintance and Knowledge by Description. A version of it is in the problems of philosophy, but there's a separate paper at the same time. Yeah. He says it there too. Yeah. yeah. But maybe in the lectures on logical atomism, he takes yeah. a more skeptical line. He, he wouldn't be surprised if he had changed his mind to one. Within a year. Be yeah. very much like Russell. Yeah. What? Very much like Russell. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. interesting. He may, he, he may well, at some point, have disbelieved in anything other than sense data, any other particulars, sense data, which would make him kind of. Idealist, yeah. or phenomenalist, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. He may have been at some point. Yeah. <coughs>
But in the problems of philosophy, he has more of a common sense yeah. epistemology. Yeah. He believes in some sort of physical objects. We, we, we're not acquainted with them, yes, but right. they exist. Yeah. And then he, later he tried to construct physical objects from sense data. Yeah. That could well be. I know in a lot of Latimer's atomism lectures, he also rejects propositions. He, he takes a much harder line yeah. than his earlier work. And so the last point is, is um, more or less the same. Uh, I was thinking that um, if we have, I, I think I agree with Kripke that, that there is a, a, a clear sense in which uh, we are not, and which existence is not a property. So for instance, if, I, if I'm telling you about some object, some, say some tiger, and, uh, and I tell you several things about it, and then I add, and it's white, then I add some, there's a clear sense in which I have added something. On the other hand, if I say and it exists, I haven't, there's a sense in which I haven't added anything. Uh, what, what would you say if I were describing to you a, a uh, extinct species? And I said, it has three horns and four legs and serrated teeth. And it still exists very remote area of Africa. That seems like you've added something. Well, well you haven't added any uh, quality. Any property. Any qualitative property. So if we, if we have this notion of a qualitative <laughs> property. Uh, I, if I, that, if you I can, think this is, I mean, as I said to Guido, or Guido said to me, it's an important property. It's not just true. No, no, I agree. It's a property. But maybe it's not a qualitative property. So if yeah, we have this notion of qualitative property, yeah, then we can sure base it on the Well, there is a difference between being uh, yellow and uh, existing, right? It's, it doesn't, yeah. isn't it intuitive? There's certainly a difference between being yellow and existing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the kind of property. Properties of different kinds. In, you know, I mean, existence doesn't feel like a relational property. I mean, like, you know, being taller than Plato is not qualitative. It involves play. It's not purely qualitative. Not existing. purely, but still. Being six foot three is purely qualitative, maybe. But being taller than Plato. Well, perhaps we can we can distinguish like uh, intrinsic, and so there may be qualitative and intrinsic properties, and some qualitative properties may not be intrinsic, and some you know. Okay. So being taller than Plato would be uh, a, a qualitative, non-intrinsic. But existence, is existence intrinsic or extrinsic? Intrinsic. I think it's relational to be part of the world. Really? If something exists, it's just part of the world. I would, yeah. But if I think of all of us in the world, I think a general public existence means it is part of a lot of the world. I exist here in the I am part of this world. That's an interesting way of looking at it. I haven't thought of it that way. Or maybe there are intrinsic non qualitative problems. Yeah, maybe. maybe better. Let's see. If You know, there's this notion of a Cambridge change, and you know, this notion. So right. when, when, when Socrates died, Xantippe became a widow, but this was not a, this was a yeah. Cambridge change. Right. It was not a yeah. change in her, a change in her circle, relationships with other people. But when something goes out of existence, this feels like a non-Cambridge, a real change in the thing. Right. Uh, when I die, this is a big change in me. So it feels intrinsic, non-Cambridge, non-relational, right. despite that. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it seems like a property that's pretty much run-of-the-mill property. I was thinking of existence more in eight temporal terms, but of course, there is Temporal existence, and what? Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing how temporal existence should be analyzed. Yeah, is it relational? People is often it? think, you know, philosophers often treat existence as atemporal somehow, but I think that's just a mistake. It's, it's like being, like any property, I'm saying, like being yellow, it's a, it's a temporal property. It's like yellow at a certain time and not yellow at another time. Can you perceive 
uh, existence, like you perceive blue, yellow, or uh, I mean, it, it seems that you can sense uh, existence. You can sense only forms and, and colors, and uh, I mean, it's not a, an argument against you; it's, a, it's an yes. against the other view. Uh, that Bless you. <laughs> You're allergic to this talk, I think. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I mean, if Descartes is right, there's a certain sense in which you can introspectively perceive your own existence. And I, I suspect there is a sense in which I can somehow perceive my own existence introspectively in a Cartesian exercise. Do I perceive your existence? <laughs> <laughs> if you're awake and I'm talking to you, I think so. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, he perceives his thinking and then he concludes that he's, yes. I mean, only an observation about uh, existence, not like an um, intrinsic knowledge. If there's only one entity in the whole universe, the ecological need is correct. There is only one entity, and then it has no relation with anything, and then it exists. It is interesting. True. I guess that's true. This is an argument for its intrinsicality. Suppose there's only one thing. Well, it could still be a relation to the world because the world would also exist even if it contains only one thing. Maybe the world is, is another thing. <laughs> you have in, <laughs> in your need at least two. I don't know. Well, I don't know how to resolve this question. <laughs> <laughs> so, last one, sorry. Only an observation. I think it's interesting that Kant made a similar distinction like Pedro. He didn't say that existence is not a predicate, but only yeah. that it's not a real, real, real predicate. Real. He makes a distinction, as far as I remember, between real and purely formal yeah. predicates and existences for him a formal predicate, which is similar to your distinction between qualitative yeah. and not qualitative, yeah. or perceptible and not perceptible. Yeah, uh, I think that's the way to read it. Um, what are other examples of purely formal predicates? I think uh, self-identity as far as um, self-logical Many thanks for talking and discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So, a pequeno intervalinho, alguns minutos, uh, três, cinco minutos antes do Breno. Três. Vai,